Hi, I'm Dave Ortega from Somerville Media Center, and I'm glad once again to be joined with uh, Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal for another news roundup. How are you doing, Julia? Good. Thanks, Dave. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. Um, thank you again for, for joining us. Um, there's, there's quite a lot to go over, uh, always <laughs> as always, uh, including uh, uh, later on, we'll talk about a, a, a story that you broke. Um, and kind of went uh, worldwide last week. Um, but as usual, we do want to start off with a, a coronavirus update. Um, what are the current numbers in Somerville? What, what, what are the trends that you're seeing? Um, so what, why don't you start us off with that? Sure, sure. Um, so yep, just always important to remember that we're still in a pandemic. I feel like I said that at the beginning of every one of these. Um, but with all the reopening going on, it's important to remember. Um, so right now, um, as of July 7th, uh, 999 had tested positive in Somerville, um, 923 had recovered, and sadly there have been 31 confirmed fatalities. Um, it is, um, as much as these numbers are you know, technically high, um, the number of new cases per day is steadily decreasing in Somerville. Um, so that means that Somerville is doing a pretty good job of containing the virus. Um, it also, there's some new information um, that's been released about kind of reopening because um, the state guidelines differ a little bit from the city guidelines, because Somerville said in the very beginning that they were going to be taking a more cautious approach. Right. Um, so technically, phase three began statewide in Massachusetts on um, Monday the 6th. Um, but the Somerville announced that they were going to be just a little bit more careful. Um, so certain phase three things like um, seeing your doctor and like certain like kind of health care um, aspects are going to move forward, like just like the state. Um, but there are certain kind of um, like business safety protocols and um, things like that. They're going to be just delayed a little bit until I think July 13th at the earliest. Um, so all of that information is up on the city website, on our website. Um, so if you have any questions, you can definitely go seek out. Um, it does differ kind of per industry. So I won't get into it specifically, but you should just kind of take a look at that. Um, another thing to just remember is that there's still testing going on. Um, we are actually looking into the fact that Cambridge Health Alliance recently made the decision to close two of their testing sites. The one in Somerville is still open, open to CHA patients and some rural residents. Um, and I think others as well at, at the moment, um, but there is currently a pretty long wait list to be tested. So um, I don't actually have many answers around that at the moment, but it's something that we are looking into because Somerville has said that they're really committed to maintaining high levels of testing. And I think a lot of people are curious as to why those testing sites have been closed. Um, so another thing, um, face coverings are still in effect. Social distancing is still in effect. Uh, the city has updated some guidelines around face coverings because it's really humid in New England summer. Um, so just make sure you kind of know what's what in terms of that. Um, it's important to always carry one with you. Most stores require you to wear them when you enter. Um, but when you are, for example, out for a walk, if there's no one around you, um, you are allowed to have your social your face covering kind of off your face, but if you are approaching someone, they say that you need to put it on when you're kind of within 30 feet of someone else. And if you can't maintain the social distance to always have one on. So just some things to remember, um, all of this information and more is available at somervillema.gov slash coronavirus. You can also find many articles about this on our website. Um, so yeah, just a quick update. And circling back really quick to the to the phase three, the delayed sure. phase three uh, that Somerville has um, enacted. Um, they're following suit with Boston. I believe Boston is also delaying phase three till next week. Um, wh where do you think that extra cautiousness is coming from? Is it because nationwide there's uh, high case numbers? Um, wh what's the what's the reasoning that that you've come across for that? Sure. Um, yes, I think you're absolutely right. There's definitely some general concern about what's happening in the Sun Belt in the U.S. Um, the cases are simply skyrocketing, um, just like record highs every every day um, in certain states like Arizona, Florida, um, I think South Carolina or North Carolina. Um, and, I, you know, as I said, though, like Somerville said from the beginning that they were going to be treating this with more caution. So it's definitely consistent. Um, but I think some of the urban areas are just aware that, you know, people are just in close proximity, it's it's harder to kind of effectively maintain a lot of these measures. And I think that they're also aware, um, you know, not just that people are coming from different states, but as picture changes across the country, and especially um, not to get into it too heavily, but especially as kind of 
face coverings and um, just treatment of this pandemic has become just heavily politicized. Um, Somerville is kind of moving forward with caution because of that, that they're like, all right, like we recognize that some people are probably going to start relaxing on these, but we want to protect the majority of our citizens. So we're just going to be a little more careful and just watch how things happen and kind of employ that kind of week or 14 day delay to see if, you know, as the reopening happens across the state, is there suddenly a surge in cases and then we can clamp down in Somerville. Um, so I think there are a couple factors, but yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Great. Thanks for that update. Um, moving on to the um, to the budget, uh, there was a lot of talk uh, about the budget uh, in our previous few roundups uh, because yeah. it, it th that's where the focus was with our city council and in city councils across the area. Um, so let's talk about the budget and specifically like the the police budget, um, which again there's a lot of attention towards. Um, what are you seeing? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> budget review continues. Um, at this point in time, the city is um, the city council is most likely going to vote on the budget on July 14th, Tuesday, July 14th. Um, so but a lot of my focus has been on the police budget because there's been a lot of public interest in the police budget this year. Um, so on the 29th um, and continuing into July 2nd, the city council reviewed the police budget. On the 29th, they kind of heard the proposed budget from the police chief, David Fallon, and from the mayor, Joe Curtitoni. Um, technically, the whole budget, like the, the whole Somerville budget had been presented on the 19th of June, um, but this was a more kind of specific presentation that kind of got at certain departments and um, shared some, some statistics around like how many police calls there are, what kinds of police calls um, they respond to, et cetera. Um, so that, that we have an article up about that. Um, I do think it's important kind of in this conversation around defunding the police that a lot of residents have brought up, that we do look at that, those, that data and kind of talk about, okay, like what does this mean? Like are, are our residents really needing the police? Um, are there any areas that are over-policed? Um, so it's a, good, it's a good thing to keep in mind. So I just wanted to kind of bring that up, that there, there is a lot to consider, you know what I mean, in terms of just the general budget, budget presentation. Yeah. Um, but in terms of community engagement, and that's really where this is at right now, um, the public hearing of the budget, which we've discussed um, on here before, was on June 24th, and it was really dominated by voices that were calling to defund the police by 60% and to not accept um, a budget that had less than a 10% decrease. Um, so that was kind of a big, a big call, you know, I mean, at this public hearing. Um, but kind of heading into the city council review, um, the, the mayor's proposed police budget had already included a 3.3% decrease from FY20. And since um, the city council has proposed several cuts um, that I believe increased like the total decrease, I'm sorry, I'm using a lot of words, <laughs> to I think like 7.2% decrease, like total from FY20, um, which is not quite the 10% and certainly not the 60%. Um, but I think it's really important, and I know these meetings are long, these budget meetings are long and tedious, but it's important to look at the discussion going on because Certainly. just on the 29th, for example, the meeting was like six hours long and at least five hours was dedicated discussion by our counselors to this issue. And they would really, really talk through like, why, you know, why are our residents calling to defend the police? Who are these residents calling to defend the police? Who is represented in these voices? What are our residents of color saying? What are they asking for? Um, so there's a lot of nuance to this issue. Um, but I think what I just wanted to kind of note, um, because there is, you know, there is still a lot of action around defending the police in Somerville, but I thought that Councillor Ballantyne brought up an important issue at one of the meetings, um, which is that she noticed at the public hearing that um, her ward, which is Ward 7, was not really well represented, and especially because her ward ha has one of the largest public housing developments in Somerville, which is the Clarendon Hills um, development. So she took it upon herself as the counselor to reach out to them. And she noted that um, in her conversations with them that they were, and the word she said they used was panicked at the idea of kind of a sudden slashing or defunding of this budget and that they, you know, were all for cuts that they, you know, there were other services in the city that they wanted to see funded and that they knew that the police budget had some cushioning that could maybe be moved. Um, but they were not in support of just cutting the budget and kind of seeing what happened, that they really wanted to have an, an effective model of 
public safety in place before that happens. So for that reason, she's, she has supported a couple of small cuts. Um, well, not just small, like it depends on what your definition is of small, but some, some cuts to the budget she has supported. Um, but she said that she, you know, she's not at this time going to be supporting that kind of like 60% slash until Somerville has had a public process around what this new model should look like. Right. Yeah. Right. And we were discussing uh, before the program, we, we had a long discussion about this and like, uh, you know, there's part social experiment to a call to defund the police in that you have to create something new around that. Right. So uh, are, are, are we ready? And is it really what communities of color are asking for right now? Right. Uh, because, you know, as you say, the, 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 the group that is most represented in Somerville, and it's largely because of the demographics in Somerville, um, are, you know, it, it could be uh, said that it, it's white people asking for a defunding of the police in Somerville. And so what does that mean? Um, and these are all really, really uh, great questions to ask, especially in light of um, violence uh, in, in the city uh, mm-hmm. last week. Uh, correct me if I correct any of these uh, <laughs> things that I'm throwing out here, but there was there were um, four individuals, uh, four women who uh, I believe three women and one man. Okay, uh, who were shot uh, in in the Mystic area um, of Somerville, and last night um, we're we're filming this on July 8th. Last night there was a, a community meeting with Police Chief Fallon that was out on their mystic activity front lawn. And then this morning on the 8th, there was a follow-up meeting uh, with Mayor Curtitoni. And we have a very special spot in my heart for this neighborhood, because when I was a patrolman, this was my area. So I know the character of person down here and what a great asset they are to this community. I want to assure you tonight that we are your police department. We're going to listen to your concerns and we're going to provide the type of policing that you want, that you desire. So give us your input. You got to see more of us down here because we want to have a presence down here. We want to work, work hand in hand with the community to make sure everybody feels safe to go outside the home. This is a very safe neighborhood. What happened the other night was an anomaly and the police acted very quickly to make three arrests that evening that directly tied to what took place in this community. What took place in this community is absolutely 100% unacceptable. We're in the backs of violence like that, like that. They show a total disregard for human life, totally unacceptable. And we're never going to stand for it. We're never going to tolerate it. We're going to very close to with our partners and the housing police to provide the utmost level of policing services, but the style and type of policing that you desire. We want pretty much your city, you're looking at standing up works for you. And this is another one of some of the special neighborhoods. And I want to echo what Steph said. I know you love your neighborhood. I came down that evening. I am grateful. And thank the Lord that nobody was killed. And I hope if they're here, their families are here to the victims who survived that night, their families, I am deeply sorry. Our prayers are with you, and we support you, and we support this community. This community is made up of hardworking families who love this city and try to give their families every basic essential you need to have a good quality of life. Our responsibility is to listen to you and give you the resources to live a safe, healthy life here in some of them. Resources we can bring to the table are limitless, so we're here to listen. And so, and you know, uh, a, a Somerville Media Center staff person who was down there last night um, said, you know, it, it is it is a complicated issue because you know you actually have residents down there who are asking for more police. And who don't feel safe. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, another kind of thing to remember is that defunding the police is one one part of this conversation. It's a big part. Um, But there are also conversations around civilian review. That's probably one of the biggest around, um, for example, Somerville is committed to hiring and established like hiring a director of racial and social justice to have more community engagement around these issues. there are other kind of pieces to this puzzle, if you will. Um, and not all of them are related to the budget. For example, the civilian review, you could say that it's somewhat related. You, you know, you need some people to drive the process and kind of get it set up. Um, but really, that a civilian review could be set up without necessarily dedicated funding. Um, 
so there are a lot, there's a whole timeline actually, if you look in the police, um, the police budget presentation, the mayor presented a timeline of action. Um, so really I think what there is for a lot of us to do is to remember that timeline and to hold, to hold our elected officials to it. I mean, they committed to this timeline um, and it, you know, it includes a number of different actions. Um, so, you know, if, you know, when the budget is approved on the 14th, hopefully, <laughs> um, it doesn't include that, you know, really significant cut to the budget. There are other things that we can do. There are other things that residents can advocate for, can join, can engage with. Um, so I think that's just an important thing to remember. Yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot to um, talk about with this issue and we're gonna have to leave it there for now. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on to what I started off with, I mentioned that you broke uh, a, a story uh, involving uh, polyamorous domestic partnerships in Somerville. Um, so what, what can you tell us about this story that just kind of took off last week? It did. Um, you know, it's interesting because, um, so, the, the, so the story behind the story <laughs> is um, on June 25th at a regular city council meeting. Oh, no, wait, even before that. So basically, Somerville did not have a domestic partnerships ordinance, which is a really standard thing for most municipalities to have. Cambridge has one, Boston has one, most do. Um, and really domestic partnerships are just kind of another legal union option um, for people who aren't necessarily interested in all the things that are required by marriage. Um, and also domestic partnerships are often more attractive to, for example, same gender or kind of a non-traditional quote unquote family um, because of the, just the history behind kind of marriage equality um, and domestic partnerships were the first kind of legal union available to a lot of these families. So it, start, it started with, um, I believe city councilor and council president Matt McLaughlin was contacted by a resident who said, hey, we don't have a domestic partnerships ordinance and I wanna access my partner's healthcare, um, but I can't because we don't wanna get married, but we'd love to be domestic partners, um, but we can't because it's Somerville. Um, so he was like, that's silly, let's just do this. So he just, you know, it was very run in the mill. He kind of just brought uh, an ordinance before the Legislative Matters Committee, which is chaired by Lance Davis, um, Ward 6 Councilor Lance Davis. Um, and they kind of reviewed it. There were a couple, you know, weeks of review. I went, you know, the city gave input and they just drafted this, again, very run of the mill ordinance. Um, but what I found was that was interesting is that uh, Councillor Davis, when I was chatting with him about this, said that usually when something is done, he just kind of like, he's like, all right, this is set, we put it through, you know what I mean? And on, onward, we pass it, great. But he said there was something about it that made him want to just let it lie, interestingly. Um, so he did. He just kind of said, hey, he sent it out to the rest of his councillor colleagues. He said, hey, please give me your feedback on this. Um, I'm going to take it up in a couple weeks for approval. And it lied, it lied, it laid, I don't know the right word. <laughs> um, huh. But basically the night before, um, or no, I think it was even a couple hours before it was the general city council meeting on June 25th, um, Councillor JT Scott just kind of tapped him on the shoulder. This is according to uh, Councillor Davis and said, hey, why does it have to be two people? Why can't it just not be defined? And Councillor Davis, his account is that he was just like, I guess, I guess you're right. <laughs> Why does it? Um, and, you know, after a little bit of back and forth, you know, they, he kind of just took a kind of fine tooth comb to it. And um, it's really very elegant legislation, if you will, because it just removes like the word both or the word he and she and replaces it with they um, or all. It's, it's very simple, very small changes. And the other kind of more significant change, I guess, is that they remove the requirement that partners have to reside at the same address. So those are kind of the two main parts of the changes in this ordinance. Um, and then it passed unanimously. Um, and when I first heard about this, um, Councilor JT Scott contacted me on Monday the 29th when it was signed into law by the mayor. Um, and he said, I'm pretty sure that this is the first time this has ever happened. And at first I was hesitant because that's kind of a big that's a big deal. That's a big claim to make. So I was like, I don't know, I got to check this. Um, so I, you know, did a lot of research and I reached out to um, this incredible attorney at the Chosen Family Law Center um, in New York City. Um, we went a little outside Somerville for our expertise. Um, 
and they said that they had never heard of it happening. So I didn't necessarily definitively make the claim that this is the first time anyone in the country has done this. Um, but based on the experts of that person, and then when the story went viral, other outlets reached out to other experts, and no one else could find an example of another city who had done this, and certainly no state has done this. Um, so it kind of blew up um, that what this what this means really is that because um, our domestic partnership ordinance is not defined by two people or people who have to live in the same at the same address, it is open to polyamorous families and relationships. Um, and I think um, just for our viewers who are not familiar with the term polyamorous, uh, yes, so, <laughs> what I was going to get to that exactly, exactly, exactly. So. Um, a lot of the questions I've gotten are, isn't that just polygamy? And polygamy is illegal in all, all states. So polygamy is by definition specifically tied to marriage and is often gendered. And there's also no mention of consent or romance in its definition, um, which is why, you know, it's often condemned because, you know, and it's often, you know, our traditional understanding of polygamy is a man who has multiple wives specifically. And that is what is um, illegal. Um, polyamory is, does not have that same definition. First of all, it is consensual. In the definition, it says um, a consensual, like multiple consensual intimate relationships. So it is tied to intimacy, romance, and consent, unlike polygamy. Um, but part of what can often make people uncomfortable about polyamory is that it isn't really heavily defined. Um, which, you know, some people have a problem with and some people think is really magical. <laughs> um, so, you know, what, there are a number of um, definitions you can find. Um, relationships can be sexual, they can be romantic. Um, they don't have to be both. Um, they are often not gender specific. So they can include, you know, same-sex partners, um, partners who are non-binary, to identify with a specific gender. Um, they are often diverse. Um, they can look different depending on the family. Um, sometimes it can look like having a primary partner, having a partner outside of that. It can have primary partner and several partners outside. It can mean having a partner who you are involved with with another partner. It can mean having a child and three kind of adults. It can look really different. Mm. Um, so that that the very nature of it, I think, is what often makes people a little bit uncomfortable because it's it's new. It's new to a lot of us. Yeah. Um, but I think so. And, and I think, you know, there's another important distinction here, which is marriage versus domestic partnership, because they're not the exact same. Um, but really what this is about is much more about healthcare and um, the kind of like power of attorney and hospital visits. So, for example, if my partner was not legally tied to me in, as either a domestic partner or um, as a marriage, so as a spouse, um, if I was in the hospital and needed someone to make a decision on my behalf, they would not have the authority to do so. Um, they would not necessarily even be allowed to visit me if that hospital only permitted family to visit. Um, so there are certain just like legal rights that are afforded to domestic partners and to spouses. Um, and this would afford those rights. So right now, if there was, the, as the common term is thruple, right? Um, if there was a family of three adults and a child, it would be a very complicated legal kind of structure to enable a third parent essentially to visit that child, for example, if it was family only. And I'm not an expert in this, but I will just say that from talking to attorneys and who are in this, there are a number of really intricate legal things that families go through in order to grant that power to the adults in that family. Um, so, so sticking with that, um, yeah where can the legal challenges come from to this? Because I imagine that the health insurance companies might not be happy to, to uh, have to extend um, that these, these policies that were pretty rigidly defined as to who the beneficiaries were. Exactly. So I could talk about this forever. <laughs> so you're going to have to stop me at some point. Um, however, this is something that Andy Eisenson, who is the Chosen Family Law Center attorney, spoke about a lot because they, they said that the definition of family as two is intimately tied to religion, capitalism, and patriarchy. And this 
exactly what you're getting to is that, you know, in the capitalism realm, health insurance companies are incentivized financially to, to limit families to two or partners to two, right? Or to one partner, I guess, um, because they don't have to pay money for more health insurance, right? And I will say first that because this is a municipal level ordinance, this is about like municipal employees. Um, this is not true of statewide. So for example, I don't think I have these rights through my employer. You know what I mean? Um, so this is specifically city city level um, health insurance providers. Um, but yes, I mean, legal challenges, like this is, I mean, if, if a city or state, um, if a state were to, for example, pass an ordinance like this, I'm sure there would be a lot of lobbying. I'm sure um, that health insurance companies would say, no, we need to cap this somewhere. We can't just leave it completely open. Um, and I think, you know, we can't, we can't not talk about religion in this because, you know, there's a real, religion has an impact in our understanding of a family as a husband and a wife. Um, and there's a reason why even when same-sex marriage passed in 2013 federally, it was written into the law that it was still two. In pretty much every legislation that you read around partnership, it's two. It's always defined as two. Um, so it, even when it kind of, the definition expanded to include like same gender partners, um, it's still only two. Um, so I, I can't, I don't want to speak to all of the different legal challenges. There are a million experts out there who could talk about this. And I, I have not done the in-depth research on that. Um, but yes, I think that we can expect legal challenges to this um, from several avenues um, and just also moral challenges to this, um, just as kind of voters and citizens. Um, so it's going to be an interesting ride. But I think that that's why the story blew up is because it is significant in that in that regard. Yeah. I, I have to add that I was uh, very impressed with the level of coverage that you provided for it, that uh, in, in the Somerville Journal article that you had, you, you had definitions for all of these. You had definitions for uh, polygamy, polyamory, what, you know, what are the differences, what, you know, what this covers and what doesn't. And uh, I just want to commend you for your thorough work on, on this that uh, got a lot of uh, well-deserved attention. Um, we're running short on time, but is there anything else that, that you wanted to, to touch on in our last moments? You know, um, nothing much, really. I guess I just wanted to, as a happy thing, um, note that Somerville Arts Council Art Beat Festival is starting on July 10th. Um, it's running through the 18th. Some things are even going through the end of the month. Um, and when I got this press release, I was really excited because a lot of the events are virtual, but some of them are not. There are like going to be signs and poems and murals and just beautiful things that are going to be popping up all over Somerville. And I, it's really what I need. <laughs> I think it may be what other people need to. So I just wanted to mention it, that we, we have an article up about all the events. There are some kid-friendly events as well um, that are happening around the city. Um, and you should definitely check out the Symbol Arts Council website because it's something happy and creative that's happening yeah. in the midst of all of this. So I just wanted to mention that. I'll just add that uh, I was able to speak with Rachel Strutt and uh, Heather Balchunas, both from the Somerville Arts Council. And so I'll be uh, making that interview a little, uh, uh, hopefully maybe it'll be available at the same time as I, I make this available. Um, so yeah, look out for that. And we are looking forward to, uh, to Art Beat this year. It's always uh, like a banner event in, in the middle of the summer, in the middle of the year for, for Somerville. And uh, It'll be a little different, but it's it's very very welcome uh, for for summer villains. Agreed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia. This as as ever was very packed with information. Um, Julia Taliesin from the Somerville Journal. Somerville Journal website is somerville.wickedlocal.com. <laughs> Thanks. Dave. There, read those articles to learn more about everything that we talked about in depth, um, and stay safe out there, everybody. <laughs>